Welcome to the 2008 Houston Harris County Regional Drug Summit, the urgency of now. My name is Ray Andrews. I serve as director of Houston Crackdown, the anti-drug program in the mayor's office. I'm delighted to see so many of you here today. Let me at this time introduce our uh, MC for the morning session, Mr. Art Rascone of ABC 13. Give him a quick hand. Thank you very much. It's good to be with you. I work with ABC Television in town at the local ABC 13 affiliate over the past two and a half decades in my 24 years of working as a journalist. I've had the occasion of working rather directly and sometimes intimately with several individuals who have been involved in various trafficking efforts or, or youth uh, being involved in the, the massive drug epidemic in which we face in this country. It is sad and it is uh, disturbing. And that's why we're here today. And the, the title of this program, Urgency Now, is just so appropriate. The urgency of now because we need to do something about this serious, serious drug epidemic that America faces and the massive trafficking in which exists along our borders the ease in which so many people are able to get a hold of, of drugs in our society. I'll never forget in my uh, many years of interviewing so many people involved in this, my interview with an 11-year-old boy, an 11-year-old boy who was in, involved in his early years in the MS-13 gang. And I had traveled to uh, Central America, to San Salvador, the roots of this gang, and interviewed several people in prisons who spoke fluent English because they had spent much of their time here in Houston or Chicago or Los Angeles involved in the drug business. This 11-year-old boy, as I asked him why he was involved in such a gang as this, he simply said, because I feel loved by my homies. And I thought... Well, clearly he doesn't feel that at home, and he's not getting it anywhere else. Don't you feel loved at home, I asked him. He said, no, I don't think my mom has ever given me a hug in my life or told me that, I love, that she loves me. His father had left him years ago, didn't even know him. So if there's any, any, anything I could say at the beginning of this summit, it is the importance, I believe, of establishing a well-grounded society at the home level. And that is one of the great reasons, I believe, because of the disintegration of the family, that we have the disintegration of society resulting in an epidemic of drugs. Over the next couple of days, we're going to be hearing from 18 different speakers. Um, it just a, a wealth of, of, um, of wisdom here, and you can find their bios right here in the, in the program. Just terrific. Allow me to introduce this morning uh, Dr. William Martin. He is a fellow uh, of religion here at the um, Baker Institute, and he's going to be giving some welcoming remark remarks. He is professor of religion and public policy here at the Department of Sociology and senior scholar at the James A. Baker Institute for Public Policy here at Rice. He's been here since 1969. Um, he is a frequent guest on national, local, and uh, news programs, discussion programs as well. His most recent book, With God on Our Side, The Rise of the Religious Right in America, is also a companion volume to a six-hour documentary mini miniseries of the same name. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Martin, please, with some opening remarks. Thank you. I, I'm also the, the fellow for drug policy at the Baker Institute, and it's in that capacity, although if you'd like to pray about it later, we can do that. But um, um, it's my pleasure with my colleague, Joan newhouse Sean, who is the fellow for uh, Homeland Security and, and uh, Terrorism there in, in, in the back, to have worked with uh, Mr. Ray Andrews of the Mayor's Office, Dr. Peter Messiah of the Houston Independent School District, and Dr. Gerald Bush of the Houston Harris County Office of Drug Policy in uh, working to coordinate this timely conference. We are fortunate, as has been said, to have an impressive roster of speakers and to, to stimulate our thinking over the next couple of days. I think all of us recognize that, we, that, that drugs, both legal and illegal, 
cause enormous harm. They can ruin the lives of those who use them and those whose lives they affect. They're implicated in a wide range of crimes and they're associated with activities that enrich criminals, endanger innocent citizens of numerous countries, involve and fund terrorism and threaten or seriously undercut the development and practice of democracy. And I'm sure all of us recognize that people who are concerned with the harms associated with drugs come to the table, in this case the tables, with different and perhaps even sharply contrasting views as to how these harms can be addressed. The Baker Institute as a nonpartisan organization is dedicated to open discussion of public policies, the kind of discussion that we expect to flourish here over the next two days, and in keeping with our long tradition of, of civility at Rice University, we are pleased to serve as a convener of events in which people who hold different views can express them freely with the expectation of courteous attention and thoughtful response. And in that spirit, I'm happy to welcome you to the Baker Institute for this important conference on the, the Regional Drug Summit, The Urgency of Now. Thank you. Uh, welcome. Uh, I'd like to start off by uh, thanking Rice University and thanking the uh, Baker Institute and the staff at the Baker Institute. And finally, I would like to uh, thank the uh, members and the volunteer members of the Houston Harris County Office of Drug Policy for the excellent job that they've done in, in uh, setting up this summit. Uh, today and tomorrow, you'll be receiving the latest information regarding diverse aspects of the substance abuse problem, all the way from the uh, molecular level, uh, and an example of this are the uh, vaccines for cocaine and methamphetamines, uh, to the global level, and this would involve uh, international origins of substances that are affecting our, our region and our community. Uh, armed with this knowledge, you all will become multidisciplinary experts capable of uh, recommending solutions to the substance abuse dilemmas that affect our area. I'd like to take a couple minutes right now to uh, talk about uh, one issue, the, the central issue, and that is the definition of, of substance dependence. And I'm not going to uh, review all the different uh, uh, models and theories. I'm going to spare you that because in preparing for this, I found uh, when I went through those uh, models, uh, people started to uh, lull into a sleepy state and finally completely lose consciousness. <laughs> I will mention that the uh, uh, DSM-4 defines substance abuse and dependence as a maladaptive pattern of substance abuse which leads to significant clinical impairment and distress. I think this is opposed to an adaptive pattern of substance use, whatever that may be. And there is a lot of uh, very interesting uh, brain research, uh, mostly in, in rats, uh, less in other animals, and, and some using scans in, in human beings uh, that have defined uh, specific uh, chemicals and circuits in the, in the brain uh, that are involved, such as the nucleus accumbens, which is the reward center, and the uh, neurotransmitter dopamine. Um, but I would like to talk more about a uh, novel model of substance abuse that I think you'll find uh, interesting and practical and easy to understand. And it's based on a uh, painfully familiar problem, which is the computer virus. Uh, for anybody that's familiar with the, the history of science, uh, you may uh, know that uh, uh, throughout uh, the history of uh, different theories, um, people have, have uh, based their models on the prevailing technology at the time. For example, when Sigmund Freud made his uh, interesting models of the mind, he used the steam engine uh, and principles of pressure expanding in certain areas and being released in other areas. So I think the computer virus is a good 
uh, current uh, problem of our time that we can use as a basis for a model of substance abuse. Now, I like to view various mental processes as software, and as such, we have a specific software, mental software area that controls our priorities. We all have priorities in our lives. Uh, we make these we make these priorities on our own, and we decide what our priorities are. Uh, for most of us, uh, those would include our uh, spouses and our families, our work, our entertainment and recreation, our religious pursuits, our security. I'm not necessarily going in order of, of importance. Uh, for a lot of people, it's in that area, but for other people, it might be different. For instance, for Ray Andrews, his main priority is keeping the mayor happy. If we're a homeless person, our priorities might involve something like getting a safe place to sleep and obtaining food or doing some socializing. We are free to make a decision at any time to change our priorities. That is, we can elect to modify this software so that we might have a new top priority. Uh, for ex example, it may become more uh, important in our scheme of things to get our mortgage payment made or to do things to be able to make our mortgage payment and other things uh, like taking a vacation while still important may fall to a lower priority. Or if we go on a vacation we may make it a top priority to relax uh, or if you're like me even if you go on vacation you're not able to relax that much. Now with substance dependence it's as if a computer virus has gotten into this area of mental software and a new top priority is inserted, and this is the essence of substance dependence. A new top priority is inserted in, into this mental software, and that uh, new top priority is to obtain and use substances. So anybody that you meet with a substance problem is going to have this new top priority. Now there's something particularly uh, nasty about this situation, and that is uh, that once this new priority is inserted by the disease into this uh, software, uh, it can't be removed. It's stuck there. And also the individual, uh, although they may be uh, impressed uh, with their experience with substance abuse, rarely chooses to, to make it their, their top priority. And they're usually rather uh, alarmed or surprised if they ever even realize that it is their top priority, which most of them don't. They're too busy following the instructions generated by the software change. I think this situation is particularly and, and painfully evident in a number of cases I've seen of, of uh, uh, mothers uh, who normally would place their children and families as their top priority and find themselves uh, having to divert their uh, personal resources to obtaining and using drugs first before being able to attend to their, their children. Uh, this new type priority is comparable to a computer virus because once this malicious software change occurs, it's stuck there and the addict cannot change this top priority. They can't say, well, it's Sunday today, uh, the heck with this drug problem, I'm going to kick back and spend time with my family. Or they can't uh, spend the holiday uh, relaxing with their family without first addressing the needs and issues of this, this new top priority. Now when we reflect on our priorities, we find that we have thoughts and plans regarding these. For the addict, their top priority reliably and predictably centers around the same set of thoughts in almost every, every addict, and this is my personal anecdotal observation uh, from 20 years in the, the field, and this occurs from the moment they wake up in the morning till the, the time they go to sleep at night and intermittently throughout the day. And those thoughts are as follows. How much drug do I have and where, when, and how can I obtain more? Uh, the addict's first thoughts in the morning are those, the addict's last thoughts in the day are those, and throughout the day they have those same thoughts. 
A small business and accounting system takes over the the addict's brain and it constantly checks the inventory of the substances, uh, preparing to order and arrange transactions for more substance. Does actually getting and using the drugs stop any of this? When the addict finally buys the drugs, does this problem go away? And the answer is no. The accounting system simply marches on, uh, assessing inventory and planning more transactions and resources to obtain more, more drugs. This software change and this new top priority commandeers the individual's nervous system and exploits their every resource for its own pursuits. Uh, many times an addict has come to my office and wondered how someone with their aptitude, uh, willpower, cunning, intelligence, resourcefulness, uh, financial strength could find themselves in an afflicted uh, state of substance dependence. Uh, but the sad truth is that uh, rather than those attributes controlling the disease, the disease uh, exploits those attributes for its uh, own ends. Now, uh, you may have noticed that the treatments for substance abuse address these malicious software changes. Uh, for example, a tenet of AA is that relapse occurs when sobriety loses its priority. And a lot of work in AA has to do with confronting and undermining this top priority that's built in. And somehow, uh, through this process of daily exposure, uh, uh, almost like uh, brainwashing, not to say anything uh, negative about AA, since it, it uh, is quite, can be quite effective, uh, somehow it loosens up and helps to change and alter this situation. Likewise, the relatively new medication treatment, uh, buprenorphine, clearly shuts down this process. Uh, the moment an addict, uh, 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 an opiate addict, uses the buprenorphine, these thoughts about where will I get these drugs and when and all these things uh, resolve and go away. Now, um, I present this model to start you off with a simple yet explanatory and relevant explanation and understanding of the topic we're addressing here. Before we re uh, proceed with the, the real experts in the field, I'd like to make a couple closing comments. Uh, in developing solutions for the problems we face in your work groups, try to be creative and resourceful look to use what organizations and resources are already available. Uh, for example, in our work at the Houston C Harris County Office of Drug uh, Policy, uh, we recognize that Houston has a number of diverse anti-drug efforts or ever, and uh, we've sought to uh, engage in the executive function of providing lines of communication between these different organizations and agencies and efforts so that there'll be a more integrated and unified anti-drug effort. Uh, finally, one last request. When you're developing recommendations or suggestions or, or plans, try to stay away from, from the conclusion that a committee is needed for some reason. <laughs> I've been to a number of these conferences that have, in the work group has concluded that a committee is needed. And uh, all I could say is uh, we have a lot of committees already, so uh, 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 maybe uh, uh, another action plan such as a secure website to facilitate communication, but some sort of concrete uh, type of action plan would be preferable to the conclusion that a committee is needed. Thank you very much, and I hope you all enjoy this conference. Thank you, Dr. Bush. We appreciate your remarks, and we always appreciate as well the great work that the, Harris, uh, the Houston Harris County Office of Drug Policy does. They're always uh, quite involved in, of course, everything throughout the Harris County area. Now, on a national perspective, we're going to be getting, getting some remarks now, hearing some remarks from uh, John Walters, who um, you know him, of course. He is the director of the White House Office of uh, National Drug Control Policy. 
He has been known as the nation's drug czar for the past seven, eight years now. Uh, Director Walters uh, coordinates all aspects of federal drug control programs and spending. Under Director Walters' uh, leadership, youth drug use has dropped to its lowest level since the early 1990s, according to various statistics. Director Walters has overseen the creation and implement implementation as well of several key anti-drug media campaigns and has restructured <clears throat> all of it to improve uh, its effectiveness. And uh, having worked in the media for so long, I am quite well aware of uh, the drug czar's efforts to get the media to be involved in, in the push for anti-drug messages out there and as well the implementation of, um, of random drug testing at uh, various schools. In fact, a thousand schools throughout the nation now do that. So ladies and gentlemen, for a, a much more broader perspective of where all of these drugs are coming from, let's uh, look at the national and international view from uh, Mr. Walters, John Walters. Uh, thank you, Art. Um, uh, thank you all. Uh, I'm, I'm responsible for the uh, coordination of the federal effort, but uh, the reason I'm here is because uh, Houston is a model of where this all takes place, which is, of course, person-to-person uh, -person at the local level. Uh, almost everything the federal government does is uh, designed to help enable and uh, support uh, people like yourselves and the people you work with and the people in this community. In fact, Houston has been a model of, um, uh, and I think this conference is an example of the uh, leadership that Houston has given in bringing the community together to focus the different parts of uh, institutional structures that really can make a difference. I think we're undergoing a, um, uh, what I would call a quiet revolution in, for the better in uh, uh, dealing with our substance abuse problems in this country. And it's rooted in the science and recognition that uh, uh, appropriate movements by institutions and in making their success broader, we can change this problem durably and effectively over the long term uh, in, in dramatic fashion. Um, uh, I want to congratulate uh, 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 Dr. Martin and the Baker Institute, uh, Dr. Bush, for his remarks, and Chairman of the Houston uh, Harris <coughs> County Drug Office. Uh, and I know uh, Ray Andrews and uh, Dr. Masai are part of the uh, organizers uh, here. I saw them earlier. I want to congratulate them on the, on the work they've done as well here. Um, Well, I uh, share uh, Dr. Bush's uh, uh, hostility toward more committees. I also know things don't, get ha don't happen on their own. So uh, somebody does the work, and I want to recognize the people that did. I saw, uh, frankly, Judge Ed Emmett, who I understand is going to speak to this group later uh, this morning when I was doing some uh, local uh, media. So you have many people from many places who uh, we we've worked with even in our office uh, who are laying uh, hands together on this problem and building consensus for the future. Uh, I think that's, that's critical. Um, I'm going to try to leave time for any questions you have that I can, if I can be helpful to your work. You know Houston better. I can tell you something about what we've seen nationally. I would say, uh, just as a, a couple introductory points, uh, uh, two things about the revolution I talked about. I think that revolution is based on the science. Some of that was alluded to um, just uh, a few moments ago. That allows us to see substance abuse for the first time as a disease in a thoroughgoing way. I recognize this is not uh, the necessarily what everybody understands and believes everywhere, but I think more and more what we're seeing is the key way in which the understanding of the brain we have now um, uh, sees this as a, as a change, and we understand that change, and we understand how to employ more parts of our community effort against that fundamental common understanding. <clears throat> what I mean by that is, um, we're using even that science uh, to help with the um, prevention uh, that we're doing with young people. Uh, more of our advertising is to help young people understand what we've seen with the changes these substances have in the parts of the brain alluded by, to by Dr. Bush. Uh, we're telling you, unlike I'm part of the baby boomer generation, I see from the looks of some of you that you're part of my generation too, uh, for better or worse. Um, we did a terrible thing. 
uh, we made substance abuse associated with growing up in America. We made substance abuse associated with becoming kind of independent from child, from being children to being adults. It's a kind of um, uh, being uh, um, uh, uh, someone who tests the limits rather than just obeys the rules. And that, that huge change um, has echoed through our society. One way it's echoed through our society is our generation has the largest rates of alcoholism and substance abuse now in our 50s and 60s of any generation before or after. Uh, we now know why. We didn't know when we were younger. That these substances not only can affect the brain and change it to make you uh, dependent, but uh, uh, use even short of dependence changes the risk factors for you for the rest of your life. Some risk factors we now know you inherit. Some risk factors you change by your behavior. And so we, by our larger exposure to these substances, have paid a price for um, the rest of our lives and will until we die as a generation. Uh, by the same token, the 24% decline we've seen in teenage drug use is something the current generation will take with them for the good for the rest of their lives. So for people who say, well, we don't really make any difference over time. Sometimes it goes up, sometimes it goes down, but it's always going to be about the same. That's clearly not true. The science is showing us if we reduce the exposure and we uh, intervene effectively, we change the demographics and the casualties for a durable period of time. Also, we know how to better engage. As I said, we can use the science that uh, tells us this is a disease to help young people see what they're doing. You're not just choosing to use drugs the way you make other uh, uses of your freedom in life. That's what my generation thought. You know, uh, we get to we get to uh, use our free time as independent individuals, and it doesn't harm anybody but ourselves. We get to do it. Um, this isn't like choosing the kind of music you listen to or the clothes you wear. It makes you sick. It makes your friends sick. And most people now, unfortunately, or fortunately, if we want to turn it to a good, have that experience in their family. They have a relative or friend, friend of the family, who've become alcoholic or drug dependent. They know they've become a different person, that taking over the brain. You know, I remember, I remember my brother when he was this way, and now he's not. Well, we can help them understand and use that suffering, let's be candid, to understand what's really happening and what you really need to do, because this is a disease we can treat. That's the other thing. This is not something where it's a failure and you fall off a cliff and we can't help. We have millions of people in recovery, and we have more of them talking about the recovery. But when they talk about it, I think it's very important that we help people who are not engaged understand that part of that recovery for almost everybody I meet is people around them somewhere said, you need to face this, uh, but you, need to, you, you can lean on me. There's some help in treatment, in support. What's AA about? It's about maintaining your recovery through helping other people with their recovery. It's a very important part of what you see in the recovery community and also I think it's a great example of what we want most of our, our children and our citizens to be, people who care about the people around them in important matters. So this great tragedy becomes an example of people who are in some ways the living embodiment of what many of us talk about and don't do as well in our lives. I think the other thing this helps us do, in addition to helping people understand, is uh, give some clarity where people have been wanting to be involved in denial and still suffer shame or avoidance. Um, in my job, some of you have the same experience, no doubt. Because of my job, I have people come up to me, sometimes family friends who have an uh, a adolescent who they know, because many times parents do know, are starting to experiment with drugs, underage drinking. And they come to me and tell me this, and what they want me to tell them I know, and you must know this too, is it's going to be okay. That most kids do this, and it's kind of a phase, or they'll pass out of it, and, um, uh, or they want me to tell them the magic uh, a secret where they don't have to be you know, too uh, worried, or they don't have to be too um, um, uh, uh, placed into a difficult position. And what I have to tell them is probably what you have to tell them is, I'm going to have to tell you something you don't want to hear. Um, we know that these substances, if you continue to use them, will make anyone dependent and will cause the disease that uh, you are fearful your, uh, uh, your child is going to face. Uh, and that's just a matter of chemistry. That's a matter of scientific law. We can make anybody an addict or an alcoholic. We can do it to monkeys and rats and mice. We do for research purposes. So you can't look the other way and say it's going to be okay. It's not going to be okay. Now, maybe they'll stop on their own. But the chances are great that if you don't act, there is a risk that they will continue to 
to do this. And you need to explain to them, and what is this, what do they have to understand? They have to understand that this disease, unlike other diseases, involves denial. That's part of the problem. So when you come and tell somebody they have a problem with alcohol or drugs, they don't say, well, thank you, I didn't realize that. I'll go right away and I'll, I'll seek professional help and I'll comply with the uh, professional recommendations and we'll get over this disease. You, they have to prepare themselves for something that they know, and I think we need to touch on that because that's a wellspring of information and power that we don't touch on enough. They're going to resist this. They're going to, they're going to yell at you. They're going to hate you. They're going to blackmail you. I'll run away from home if you don't let me do this. They want to know that, well, I just found my child for the first time with just marijuana. And that's, that's okay, right? And you have to tell them it's never the first time. It's never, never, never the first time. It doesn't happen. Probabilities are infinitesimal. Uh, and they will lie. This will be the best lying they'll ever do in their lives. Uh, um, um, and they're going to lie to you. And you say, well, I don't want to distrust my child. They can't help themselves. That's what the circumstance and the substance is doing to them. So we need to use the tools that bring a community together. What we've tried to do and what this city has been a leader on is using more institutions to help parents and, commu and community leaders. You've been a leader in screening in the healthcare system. Ben Top Hospital was one of the first to do regular screening in the intake of patients across the board. Do you drink, do you use drugs to help them get brief interventions if they weren't dependent or to refer them to more intense care if they needed it. We've taken this uh, program nationwide. We now have codes in the public pay, Medicaid, Medicare system for reimbursement that states can adopt. We're getting more health insurance uh, companies to reimburse for screening and brief interventions. We now take, we want to take it so every time you see a healthcare professional, just as they take your pulse, just as we screen for things like hypertension and uh, diabetes, a preventable disease, we can help prevent this from moving from uh, initiation to acute disease. In addition, we can get people with acute disease into, health, into, into proper treatment, and we're reinforcing the message this is a disease. It's not about lifestyle. It's about your own health, and we understand that. We need to make that more salient. We're using screening in the workplace. We've had uh, uh, drug testing in the workplace for many, many years. A great example of revolution, of course, is the military had a huge uh, problem uh, 20 years ago and used uh, testing. But also, of course, many uh, uh, companies are now using this as a way of retaining uh, important professionals and preventing disease from uh, being a, a progressive uh, problem for their health and safety and longevity with the corporation and, of course, with their families. In addition, as was mentioned, we have, at the President's direction, uh, for the first time since the State of the Union speech in 2004, provided money for random testing in schools. Once we had a Supreme Court decision that said random testing may not be used to punish, must be done confidentially, must be done with the parent to get the parent and the student help, we now have a means of using a huge public health tool that we've used for other diseases. I don't know whether Texas is a state that requires screening for tuberculosis for children to come to school. Many states do. Why? Because a child who has the disease and is not treated will get sicker and they will infect other children. That is exactly what happens with this disease, although it's not spread by a virus, despite the metaphor. It's spread by behavior from child to child. This, what does the testing do? It finds the particular student that is at risk and gives the society and the schools an obligation to intervene with them and their parents to get them uh, clean and sober and to make them successful. What happens now in most other places? They continue to use, frequently not helped, and until they either drop out of school or drop out of school and enter the criminal justice system or whatever happens through some random set of events. What does random testing allow us to do? It allows us to t use the institutions of the schools as well as the healthcare system to help us head off this disease and contain it. If you understand it's a disease, you begin to see the epidemiological components of this disease and how it's spread. Um, we have also been, been uh, uh, um, fostering the advance, I'm going to see the Harris County Drug Court later today, of the use of screening and intervention in the, pub, in the criminal justice system. To take people who are not violent offenders that are an immediate threat, but to get them into treatment. Many times we wait until they offend over and over and over and over again, until they either go to jail or prisons or until they become such a destructive um, uh, factor for their lives uh, that they uh, are... Um, extremely difficult for society to continue with. We don't have to do that. Today, 
the single largest source of intake is the criminal justice system, over 2,000 drug courts nationwide, and the court becomes an instrument of intervening and supervising. Some of you no doubt work in the drug court system and see the powerful tool this is to break the cycle of self-destruction. Good for the individual, for the family, for the community. It saves money in the long term. It saves lives in the long term. Uh, we're beginning to see that it's not about giving people a free pass. I've seen, if you want to visit a drug court if you're not convinced, uh, it's not fun. I've seen people actually stay in the drug court system longer than their sentence would have been. Because, uh, and uh, drug courts that don't accept failure. If you fail, you get a proportional response uh, uh, of an adverse penalty, a partial incarceration, loss of some of your freedom, and you're going to come back and succeed. I've seen people enter drug court and say, Judge, I'm not going to make it. They, you've seen people in addiction. They've given up on themselves. Their parents have given up on them. How can the love of a father or mother die? Well, it does with alcoholism and substance abuse, because you give up on yourself. I've seen judges and court professionals say, I know you don't believe in this. We're going to make you succeed. And the most common thing you hear, although they, it's a, when everybody says it, it's the first time for them, is uh, when they graduate from drug court, the day I was arrested was the luckiest day of my life. Saved my life. I'd be dead. Uh, we're seeing this used in more directions uh, for family court because we know substance abuse is a huge part of the problem of child abuse and endangerment. Um, we're seeing combinations of, uh, you have some of the here, a mental health court working on co-occurring disorders with substance abuse and mental health to get the ability to care for people into the lives in a, an effective way of those who are in some cases uh, uh, most affected by the disease and most in need of the institutions that help them. We have also fostered drug-free communities. I see Sue Thaw here from, from CADCA. Uh, we've been expanding uh, drug-free communities, an effort by, to help the uh, organization of individual communities bring together the resources, federal, state, and local, on sound grounds. We just finished our first evaluation of drug-free communities where they exist, working primarily on underage use, alcohol, tobacco, drugs. Um, we've had, and as they mature, we've had significant declines in comparable demographic areas of rates of use. Uh, another tool that helps the community use these other uh, uh, um, uh, institutional changes for, for good. Because um, I want to leave time for questions, I'll just mention um, um, two other things for your consideration. One, um, we've had significant declines not only in use, but even in um, uh, adult use as measured by uh, workplace um, uh, drug testing. Uh, Today, since we've, the earliest consolidated workplace drug testing rates go back to 1988, today we're lower than any time during that period. Um, cocaine has dropped dramatically in the last couple of years. Methamphetamine has dropped dramatic, dramatically. Marijuana has gone down. Um, so not only for young people, but for adults. Some of that is also the contributions being made by supply reduction. I didn't want uh, us to forget that. The efforts by Colombia, by Mexico, to, for the first time more aggressively attack these. We've seen um, uh, reports as high as, in some areas of the country today, a 50 percent decline in the availability of cocaine. Um, uh, at between 2006, uh, mid-2006 and the present. Um, methamphetamine, the efforts to go after both the organizations producing in Mexico and the domestic production <coughs> by uh, cutting off the precursor chemicals, pseudoephedrine and ephedra, have been dramatic in most areas of the country and uh, a welcome change from this horrible, horrible substance. We still have more to do, but we are following through against these efforts. And when you see the effect of supply and demand together, youth rates of cocaine and uh, uh, methamphetamine use, where that's a small part but a, uh, a troubling part for some, have dropped up to 60 percent over the last five years. So you begin to see what happens when we work on the reducing the business side of the supply and the, um, and the uh, uh, demand side uh, consumption through these, these other efforts. Again, we need to follow through. We take our eye off the ball. We forget about this. When problems get better and they're not as big a threat, we forget about what we're doing and the urgency of your work and the urgency to follow through. But there is a revolution going on. And, and finally, I would mention that there is a, uh, as you know, um, uh, uh, one area that, despite all these trends, has been a counter area, which has been prescription drug abuse, has gone up. Uh, led by uh, synthetic opioids, painkillers, Oxycontin, Vicodin. Uh, and we need to use the tools appropriate to that particular problem, where I think screening is an important part of that in the healthcare system. Also, educating healthcare professionals about some of the dangers and follow up. Uh, we are working with states to put in prescription monitoring programs that will help them see uh, um, uh, the small number of, of criminal uh, distributors here. And I think we need to also uh, um, recognize that for young people, it's a different problem than for 
adults who may be dependent. For young people, there are, in many cases, we've used our media campaign to alert parents. They're going into medicine cabinets and taking pills out and using them. Um, they're not buying it. There's no barrier to entry. It's in your home, and it's for free. Uh, they've been told on the Internet that, yes, street drugs are dangerous, but pills are, are known quantities. They're made by a regulated industry. They're safe highs. Obviously, Vicodin, uh, Oxycontin, and others are extremely powerful, extremely dangerous, and because young people have a tendency to use these in combination with alcohol, which as you no doubt know, can be deadly with these particular substances, it's, uh, it's an urgent need. We're working to try to help parents get control of these substances in their home, talk to your kids about pills. Somebody is talking to your kids on the Internet, or somebody's talking to their friends on the Internet and will talk to your kids. Don't let them be fooled. Um, Again, my job and your job covers a lot of topics. I have not tried to exhaust them. I hope I've been somewhat helpful in telling you what we see and why I'm quite optimistic that we can maintain the momentum. Obviously, that happens community by community, and one of the encouraging things is all of you being here and uh, uh, being committed to creating the consensus on the basis of what's best known, what works best, and driving it forward with your support and, uh, and effort. Uh, it's been a great honor for me at the end of uh, my service in this administration to uh, work with communities such as this, and I want to thank you for being in the forefront of the, the achievements and the knowledge that we now have. Uh, with that, I'll be happy to take any questions people have about uh, things that I can be helpful with, and if you don't have many, then you can go on with your agenda. Yes, sir. Dr. Bush. Walters, could you uh, speculate as to why our community has an endemic crack? Co uh, Director Walters, could you speculate as to why our community has an, en an endemic crack cocaine problem as opposed to, say, a methamphetamine uh, problem or heroin problem? Yeah, I, I'll tell you what we know and what we don't know. We don't, we don't exactly know why. Um, um, methamphetamine has taken the pattern it has. We've had it a longer term cocaine and crack cocaine problem in many of our cities. Houston's one of them. Um, I served in the office, uh, I now hold uh, uh, not as director, but during President Bush's father's administration. Um, and one of the first five high intensity drug trafficking areas was Houston because of the, both its proximity to distribution from Mexico, but also the intensity of the problem here. So it's been a while. Um, what we've seen with methamphetamine is in, in, in the West, especially like Los Angeles and San Diego area, uh, over the course of the you know, last seven years or so, uh, methamphetamine had displaced the rates of cocaine use and had become a bigger and more prominent factor. That has not happened in the East and the South. Um, some of it may have to do with the, um, the availability of cocaine as a result of, you know, from the time of the early 90s to now, the flow of cocaine coming up from South America, especially Colombia, was going through the Caribbean and through Florida. The, some of you are old enough to remember the cocaine cowboys in the Miami area. Um, we shut that down largely, and it still is a, 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 a much smaller uh, uh, way of coming in. But the flow through the Central American Isthmus up through Mexico made uh, not only the southwest border, but Houston as a conduit toward the East Coast a bigger and more available area. Again, cocaine was, of course, crack cocaine was a kind of marketing effort. I mean, initially, cocaine in the early 80s was very expensive. The jet set did it. It was powdered cocaine. And the, uh, uh, the, the cartels learned um, uh, what uh, Walmart learned. Well, if you can make it inexpensive and mass market it, you can make a lot more money. And crack cocaine was that solution. Let's freebase it and, and drive it. And we can drive it into, again, where did those cartels start in Colombia? They started with marijuana. That's how they had distribution networks. Then they marketed uh, uh, cocaine. Uh, I would say the single biggest area where we don't have consensus, which leads to both cocaine and meth, and, 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 but also an end in itself, is marijuana. Today, the, the question I get is, well, it's only marijuana. Like, it's only using marijuana. Um, you see, if you're in treatment, single biggest cause of treatment among illegal drugs is marijuana. Today's potency is higher, the rates of uh, initiation, the age of initiation is lower. Our attitude toward marijuana is different. And um, for teenagers today in this country, uh, more teenagers seek treatment, admission for treatment for marijuana than all other illegal drugs combined. Uh, more than for alcohol, which is a new phenomenon, as teenagers. So it's not only just an entry point, but it's a dead end. Um, I would say cocaine and other drugs 
Also, I think we learn a lot by looking at this in an epidemiological uh, uh, framework. Um, so you need to know today what your drug problem is because it's going to change and where it is. It's connected to individual people. You begin the, the, the highest, the, the smallest number of users in most communities, but the highest volume of users, I don't need to tell you, are those who are dependent, whether you're talking about alcohol or tobacco or drugs. So if they get established, if you get an established group of users who then become an established group of dependent users, the dollars are pulling more and more drugs into your community that presents more to initiate new individuals. We had this go on for too long. We weren't as effective. Uh, we didn't know some of the things we know now. Um, and we didn't have tools on a wide scale basis like drug courts, like testing, like screening, um, uh, and even the effectiveness we now have with law enforcement. Uh, uh, we're eager to work with uh, Mexico now because they have the ability to allow us to work together against these problems. Now, the downside is that, of course, the Mexican cartels have become very powerful and dangerous. But they're not just drug cartels. You see now some of them, as a result of lost revenues, is a speculation, are now turning more to kidnapping, extortion, and simply just brutally trying to control territory as mafias did. All of these are horribly violent, so they're kind of terrorist mafias. And uh, um, while the opportunity to change the future of our two countries by giving institutions a chance to work in Mexico is, is unique and historic, and we're working very hard. I was in Mexico last week to, to, to support that in, in as rapidly as we can, even at this time of transition in our government. Um, uh, it, you know, what happens to our countries if uh, the uh, northern part of Mexico is governed by mafias? You talk about ungoverned spaces close to home. It's horrifying. And to think that they just stay on one side of the border, I tell people outside of this area of the country, you know, the border is not a line. There are communities that live together, have families together, who shop and work together. To think that they don't come over here and commit acts of violence, assassination, we're not the same rate as Mexico. But the fact of the matter is we are in this together and we need to take the opportunity to solve it together. And that's why we're very encouraged by this unique time, but it's a very dangerous time. And uh, uh, I like to remind people that, uh, that just marijuana is the single biggest source of cash to those terrorist mafias. Uh, it's blood money. Uh, it's another reason not to use. Yes, sir. in Southern California in Orange County, and I thank you for being here and sharing your thoughts uh, with this open forum. My question is based upon the concept of federalism. Uh, in fact, I anticipate that everyone in this room, including you, would agree with the concept that the federal government does not have all of the answers. And why, then, doesn't the federal government go along with the concept of federalism and trust the people of California, for example, who passed a medical marijuana provision by, in Prop 215 by 56 percent of the vote uh, and allow medical marijuana programs to go forward? Why does the federal government not trust the people of Texas to act in the way that they believe would best safeguard and protect the people of Texas? Why don't they trust the government of Texas to stake their hand as well? Uh, I just ask that question. Uh, in the spirit of concept of federalism, where we have 50 crucibles of democracy trying best to figure out the way out of these various problems. Yeah, well, I certainly am someone who appreciates the issue of, of federalism, but we've also seen certain problems. Um, you know, we're not the United States under the Articles of Confederation. We're the United States under the Constitution. And we changed because we had certain problems that required us to surrender some of the independence of the subordinate unity uh, of the states to a uh, to have a more coordinated threat uh, response. Um, I think sometimes uh, there are no questions. I've worked, you know, I started in government during the Reagan administration. Our goal was to roll back some of the heavy end of government, and I think that's uh, something we we still need to continue. What? My office and what I think federal efforts on drugs came about as a result of was that the drug problem was flooding individual local jurisdictions. It used weak jurisdictions to set up shop and to move drugs and to, and to uh, foster uh, um, uh, more extensive numbers of users that bred a cancer that wasn't contained within that jurisdiction. And um, so the partnership that was, that was sought to be created between the federal, state, and local government was one that was based, hopefully, on science and sound policy. Now, you raise an issue 
Mirstead, I was just out in California talking with uh, and, 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 and uh, um, talking to the press with some local officials. You have another uh, ballot initiative on the ballot, uh, uh, Proposal 5, that's uh, designed to gut, in my view, uh, the effectiveness of drug courts. Uh, promise a lot of money, but say they, the people have to have be arrested six times before they can finally be sent to jail. So the threat of jail, if you don't comply with drug court, is removed. Money can't be spent for testing under this proposal. And it's not funded by the people of California. It's funded by George Soros and a couple of his billionaire buddies out of, uh, out of New York. Um, so we've seen a number of these initiatives, including the medical marijuana one. Now, that has been, I think, one of the most destructive vectors to try to legalize drugs. I also think, in addition to federalism, I believe in honesty. You want to legalize drugs? Stand up and say it. It loses 95 to 99 percent, depending on where you are in the country, because people have lived with too much of this. They know what that means. So what's happened is a group of people have decided, well, let's undermine some of the institutions. And they've done that from outside, not with grassroots, but they've funded people to sign petitions where they can do ballot initiatives. They've done one-sided advertising, $5 million spent in California by George Soros, who, by the way, doesn't live there, is not going to live with the consequences of this, doesn't now. But he has an experiment in mind, and he's perfectly you know, uh, within the freedom of uh, we expect in this country to express his views, to even fund this. But I do think we're also within our rights to say, this is kind of a lie. Um, why, is, why would it be that marijuana is the only medicine ever in the history of the United States that we can't uh, uh, show is safe and effective through the regular processes of licensing medicine? I mean, uh, you know, it, it's, no one would say, I need painkiller, I need morphine, but I have to smoke opium to get the morphine I need. That would be laughable. Uh, what's the effect of marijuana, allegedly? Well, it's kind of nebulous, and people say, when I smoke marijuana, if I'm depressed, if I have a headache, if I have pain, if I, you know, have writer's block, some people. When I smoke marijuana, I feel better. Well, of course you do. It's an intoxicant. You'd feel better if you smoked crack. You'd feel better if you took meth. You'd feel better if you took heroin. You'd feel better if you drank Jack Daniels in sufficient quantities. That doesn't make any of those medicines. And it's a ludicrous argument that's been made here. But how has it been made? It's been made by showing people at a cemetery in ads saying, this is my dead relative. And they felt they needed comfort and they needed marijuana, smoked marijuana. And you shouldn't be heartless as citizens. Or showing people in wheelchairs saying, I feel better when I smoke marijuana. Playing on the compassion and the sympathy that is, I think, the core of what Americans think is a minimum level of decency. So it scared people into feeling like, if I'm against this, I'm cruel, or in telling them the government's cruel. Not telling them what the truth is about marijuana, not telling them what the truth is about real medicine. And, and what has this caused in California? I was in San, San, uh, San Francisco last week as well. A huge explosion of people buying houses in residential areas to convert the inside and in, not worry about code wiring, everything else convert the inside into marijuana grows of high-potency marijuana on the grounds that they are caregivers for people who need medical marijuana. And they're then sending it to the dispensaries. Today in San Francisco, there are more marijuana dispensaries than there are Starbucks. And why is the federal government acting? Because this spreads not only from San Francisco, but it goes all across the country. Uh, these same groups doing the indoor grows are going to Kentucky and to Washington State and Oregon and other parts of the country because it's very valuable. High-potency marijuana grown in these sites can be worth $4,000 a plant, and they have 500 to 1,000 plants in these houses. Secondly, what, what happens in this case? We become a society where we're playing games with the law and the serious issue here, where um, you can say, you know, you know why is it? This was real medicine. We don't warn people. No single ballot initiative has warned people as you would with any other medicine. This can be addictive. This can cause uh, a serious mental illness, especially among youth, psychosis, neurosis, thoughts of suicide. This can cause um, uh, a depression of your immune system. No legitimate warning. It's not really supposed to be medicine. It's a game we're supposed to all be kind of uh, use the disagreement about marijuana and play a game about it that's most detrimental to our youth and to those who are dependent. What are these storefronts providing? They're providing a, the most serious cause of treatment need, the substance most serious cause of treatment need in the country to people and pretending that it's okay. And that's the best we can do. Uh, it's not okay. 
And uh, I think the point here is that the national consensus and the national law does make a difference. And it's awkward for the federal government. We don't have the resources to police localities. But we are brought in when, um, you know, more and more states see the consequence of this. And I would say that I think that is becoming more visible in California. It would be interesting to see what happens with Proposal 5. But if it doesn't, I mean, the current attorney general of, of California, as you know, is Jerry Brown, not exactly a hard right winger who has just you know, begun to promulgate regulations under this proposition to begin to close down uh, the freedom of, a of action of many of these dispensaries. So again, uh, I respect federalism. We want people to rule, govern themselves. But the premise of, of self-government is that people will have the information to make informed decisions. When you use the fact that I have billions of dollars from someplace else and I want to do a social experiment in your state, and I'm going to tell people things that are grossly misleading. I'm going to say to everybody else who stands up against me, you're a cruel person who wants people at end of life to die in pain and tells public officials that if you stand up and say something, we're going to, we're going to bring lawsuits against you for meddling in a ballot initiative and you're supposed to not be involved in politics. When you try to you know, do McCarthyite tactics on the left, um, I think it's important to kind of stand up with local officials. That's why I've done it. My predecessor didn't do it. But what's changed the face here is billionaires now want to fund legalization, and they're willing to lie to do it. And if we stand back, um, we're going to cause more harm, and we know better. That's the thing. It's not like this is – it's not even close to a debate when you come down to it. That's my view. Uh, and I'm not a, a – I use the advice of people in medicine. This isn't a serious issue, but it is a serious threat if you don't stand up and tell the truth. Director Walters, um, one of the key things that you have brilliantly supported has been the Access to Recovery uh, initiative. And now that we have many of our returning vets, uh, veterans who are coming back home, particularly many who are National Guard members, which have a different set of military benefits than the full military, could you see um, us expanding the Access to Recovery initiative to help many of those soldiers coming in, to help them with recovery support services, and the kinds of things that they need in their local communities? Because it's been such a success in terms of helping people achieve recovery. Yes, um, what Beverly's talking about is the first initiative by President Bush in 2002 was to say, we have a gap between the number of people who seek treatment and the people who get it. Now again, we know denial is a part of this disease, so many of the people who have the disease don't seek treatment. Uh, um, so that's, that has to be said, up to 80, 90 percent is the estimate. So we, that's why we need screening to help identify them and help them to recognize this. We need help by families to recognize that you need to, you need to push against the resistance to this disease. But access to recovery, we had the time uh, when the president did his first day of the union, um, the evidence we had was about 100,000 people nationwide per year sought treatment and so they didn't get it because there wasn't uh, um, treatment availability. Our national estimate was that an individual treatment session on average, all kinds, inpatient, outpatient, cost $2,000. So the president proposed to unilaterally uh, make an effort to close that treatment gap by seeking $200 million, 100,000 times 2,000, even I can do the, that math, um, um, $200 million to unilaterally close that treatment gap for those coming in. Congress ultimately appropriated $100, $100 million, half that amount. And, but, so we, but, but what we tried to do is have states that had particular gaps come forward with both that need and a plan to close those gaps. Some uh, used uh, drug treatment courts. Some were focused on meth as it was growing. Some were focused on services to, to um, juveniles, which are in short supply in many areas. Some, uh, uh, especially women, but uh, uh, some with parents with dependent children. Um, that kind of service is, is uh, needed in some places. In addition, we offered this in terms of dollars that would follow the individual so that they would get care and they would also get recovery support because we knew not only the immediate uh, treatment need but um, uh, housing, a job, family re uh, reconciliation and so forth were important to the durability of that recovery. Um, we've been very pleased with the number of people in the states that have seen this. They've seen remarkably uh, improved results at sustaining recovery and getting people there. Uh, we have been working with the Veterans Administration to improve screening and treatment in the uh, veterans system, and they're doing more screening and more treatment. Uh, we have been working with uh, DOD, which does a great job. Sometimes people think that DOD just tests. DOD treats everybody. Even people they're going to discharge, they treat them before they discharge them. It's a great record. They are looking at more of this, obviously, both because of post-traumatic stress issues and because of, of, uh, um, of drug abuse and um, 
uh, prescription drug abuse. Um, um, some of the individuals in the military can, depending on the state, be plugged into these programs. Not every state has an access to recovery program, but obviously we'd like to see that in more places. In some cases, we'd like to use our community coalitions to help expand the connectivity between recovery support services and, uh, and treatment. But lastly, just let me say one point on the military, and, 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 and I think the, uh, I believe, I'm a great believer in the underused power of random drug testing. And I know this is still somewhat controversial in some areas. Um, the first person who held something that could be considered a, pre a precursor to my office uh, held that office during President Nixon's uh, presidency. Some of you are even old enough to remember that. Um, and it happened because soldiers were coming back from Vietnam dependent on heroin and opium. And uh, it, was, it was unconscionable that we would take people from their families, they served their country, they risked their lives, and we send them back drug addicts. That was not acceptable. And there was a huge effort uh, that ultimately led to testing in the military and so forth. Um, that was an example of where the society was. It's a different military today. It's a volunteer military. Um, it also was an example of, of uh, um, how, we, how we treated this. But um, today, we have men and women, of course, serving in Afghanistan. We're acutely aware. Ninety percent of the opium and heroin in the world is grown in Afghanistan. Too much. We've just had a decline, but we have more work to do. Um, we have virtually no positives for soldiers serving in Afghanistan. Uh, that's partly the different military. That's partly the different uh, character of society. It's partly random drug testing. Um, and it shows you how powerful these tools are when we use them effectively. So that's why I think the Quiet Revolution is one that can radically change the victimization from substance abuse in our society across all drugs of abuse. The urgency is how fast will we deploy them. That's your work for the next uh, a few days and for the next five years. Uh, uh, we wish you Godspeed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walters. That was terrific. We appreciate you being here today. That was wonderful, and I hope you were able to get some uh, terrific points from his remarks here this morning. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we uh, remind you that the uh, restrooms are on this side and that uh, lunch is coming up just after 12 noon. Um, still, we have some wonderful uh, speakers coming up and uh, just sort of a background on what this uh, next couple of days is going to be about. We have a video presentation for you as well, but it's just a couple of minutes long. Well, say can you see the 4,248 young people that took illicit drugs in one day. By the dawn's early night, 909 12 to 17 year olds have tried cocaine today. But so proudly we hear, except for those 12,998 people who were killed in alcohol related incidents. At the climate's last evening, more than 6 million people have tried to find cocaine at least once. Osei is that star spangled man yet waiting over the land of the treatment facilities, not equipped to serve all of our citizens, at least not for free. And the home of the more than one million people who look for treatment while still trying to remain brave. statistics are a glaring reminder that it is time to make a change and make a difference in issues that surround drugs and drug-related activity. Because of your standing as a respected, influential, and involved community leader, an invitation was extended to you to take part in this forum, the urgency of now, so you can be a part of that change. And there is an urgency surrounding the need for taking this call to action. Alcohol and other drugs directly impact the lives of millions of Americans and affect the delivery of health care and overall quality of American life on many levels. Your invitation to attend these two days was not accidental or coincidental. It was purposeful, so that you can take 21st century action in our community to address these concerns. You, along with leaders and decision makers like you, from all sectors of the community, 
are convened here to work collaboratively to achieve the principal goal of developing a five-year strategic action plan that will be presented to elected officials who represent the Houston-Harris County region at local, state, and federal levels. During the next two days, you'll hear from a diverse group of speakers. These conversations will serve as a springboard to work sessions where you and cross-sectional groups of your peers will prioritize local challenges and identify real-world strategies to begin to address one of four summit domains, prevention, treatment, data collection, and criminal justice or judicial systems. Writing your thoughts and planning. There are no right or wrong answers, just the real need to elicit change. The opportunity is here, the needs are real, and the urgency is now to plan for a better, drug-free Houston and Harris County. The urgency is now, ladies and gentlemen, and as people of influence in the community, it is primarily your responsibility, I suppose, to deliver that message to the public and make those changes. One of those who has been um, extremely influential in the community, Beverly Watts Davis, she is of the Center of the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration, motivational speaker. She's absolutely terrific. Um, and the media, we've had the privilege of, of seeing her in action. The center works in partnership with federal agencies, the state and local government, public and private sector organizations as well, to prevent the onset of illegal drug use, alcohol abuse, tobacco use, by building resilience among the young people, such a crucial area in which needs to, be, needs to happen. Among those young people and promoting as well protective factors in the community, not only our community here, but statewide and nationwide as well. Ladies and gentlemen, Beverly Watts Davis. You all, it feels so good to be home. First off, if everybody will do uh, for me, if you all will just quickly, uh, uh, everybody just stand up real quickly. I know we've been sitting for a little bit. Okay, everybody, your hands over your heads. Let's just kind of reach up, kind of move around a little bit. Okay, now put them out in front of you. Okay, back up again. All right, out in front of you. All right, now you've had my handouts and my overheads. <laughs> and I appreciate you all doing that. Have a seat. You know, the, the, um, it, that was, I just wanted to say, it's just kind of a way for us to kind of move around, but I did that uh, most recently with, in a meeting of law enforcement, and it was so funny because the uh, master of ceremonies actually was a gentleman from the FBI from the uh, Dallas office. He said, Beverly, I've got to remember that. He said, I, he said, I've never been in a room where I've seen that many cops have to raise their hands. Now they know what it will feel like. <laughs> <laughs> So I, it is just when I said it is truly good to be home. I want to truly thank uh, Ray Andrews, uh, Director Walter, Steve Katarinas, who, who just spoke. Uh, the Houston crackdown, I was, uh, I was actually here in Texas when Houston crackdown was started, uh, when Janice Ford Griffin was one of your first directors. She's still a good friend. And, um, and, we, and we visit often the Houston County and uh, City and County Office of Drug Control Policy, Rice University, Baker Institute. And where is Ellen? Ellen, where are you? Please right stand and just, if you will stand. I just want you all to know, um, one of the main reasons I'm here is because Ellen uh, asked me to be. And I want you to know, and I want to thank you for that, Ellen. Um, being on the West Coast, coming back to the East Coast, going back to the West Coast, uh, my, my travel schedule has been really, really very busy, but you all are truly that important. I want to thank each and every one of you because you are the heroes and sheroes that have truly, truly helped us accomplish those things across the country. When we hear about the drug use going down, use going down, all the great things that happen, it is because of you who sit in this room. You get up every single day and you do what you do to make that difference. And I know there are often times that um, as you go about and you deal with all the 
all the things that you have to deal with. Sometimes you wonder if you're making a difference, but just know your collective action, the fact that you all are coming together, you take your time to step back, to think about where you're going and how you're going to get there is really going to make that difference. And what, what Ellen talked to me about, and, and really I want to be able to paint the bigger, bigger picture, because as you all come, to, as you begin to think about your planning efforts, I want you to think about how what you do is going to impact so many different um, areas. Now, th this question I should get most, most of the hands in the rooms up. How many of you all are working on uh, substance abuse prevention in some way, shape, form, or fashion? All right. Almost everybody in the room, correct? How many of you all are also working on crime prevention? I know I've seen some law enforcement here. Crime prevention? Okay, a couple more hands. Uh, how many of you all are working on family development? Okay. How about economic development? Not as many. Okay. Let me just ask you all, when I, the next time I ask this question, I really do want every hand in this room to go up. I asked you all about how many of you all are working on drug prevention. That was almost everybody in the room. But then I asked you all if you all are working on crime prevention, and I saw about seven hands. Ladies and gentlemen, if you all are working on the prevention of illegal drug use or the prevention of the misuse of legal drugs, you absolutely are working on crime prevention. The number one nexus to crime is substance abuse. The number one nexus to crime is illegal drug trafficking. So when you do what you do in terms of preventing drugs, you're doing that as well. I asked you all how many of you are looking, working on family development. I had only three hands go up. Um, and if you think that when you do what you do is not connected to keeping your families healthy and strong, it absolutely is. How many, do I have any faith leaders in the room? Okay, we do. Absolutely, when you, the, the number one factor when you think of the things that have broken up our families, have put stress on our families, it has absolutely been substance abuse. So when you do what you do to prevent that, you're affecting that. And this is, this is one, um, I saw two hands go up for economic development. You know the number one factor for why businesses choose to be, to locate where they locate? has everything to do with crime rates. What's the driving factor for crime? Illegal drug use and substance abuse. And when, and, when we, and when we don't have businesses in our communities, it affects the economic viability. So when you do what you do, you're impacting that. And I want you to think about that because oftentimes so many of us are defined by the money we receive. How many of you all in here are providers? Okay. Most of you. And most, most providers define themselves by your funding. I mean, people used to say to me all the time, I was a drug lady in San Antonio. Okay, but really, what they, what they fail to see is what we were really about is helping to create community connections, helping to create a safe and healthy community. And we were about all of those things. And one of the key things that I want to be able to, in, throughout my talk and throughout the rest of your conference, is for you all to think not of yourselves just by how you are defined in terms of the funding streams. Most of you receive substance abuse funding, but you are so much more than that. And it's important for you to think about that because over these next two years, ladies and gentlemen, it's going to be really important for you to think much broader about how you make that, con those connections. I've given you, uh, is it, I've given you some handouts. But, and as I go through this, I just want, I, I want to be able to go through this. And, I, and, and as we're going through this, I want, I want us to think about how much broader you are than what you're, than truly your funding. Um, I'm supposed to have a clicker. Um, how do I advance to the next? Am I missing it? Okay. Uh, if the person in the back, if you can hear me, if you'll go to the next slide. There's someone back there? There we go. All right. Oh, great. Duh, you all. It's, look, it, it's a huge clicker. It's a keyboard. <laughs> I am technologically challenged, most definitely. What we really have to be about is building sustainable outcomes and community and, and infrastructure. And I, and I recognize as we talk about being here and what we're going to be doing, and I know everyone is worried about what's going to happen next year. Will there be funding for next year? How are we going to keep our doors open? And what's, and what's so key I mean, it is such a daily challenge, and I, and I say this. We always are asking ourselves, what are we trying to sustain, and how do we, how do we know that what we're doing is working? And I, and I say that because I use this because oftentimes as we're out there, 
every time that we're doing things, we feel like with many of our efforts, it, it continues, you know, we're, we're walking along, we're doing with this, and it's like, bam, we have another smack down. There's something else that we have to do. And, I, and, I, and this is such a daily challenge for all of us. And so when we think about this, what is it we are trying to sustain? I mean, I step back and I know that Houston, that this whole idea of Houston cracked and you all coming together actually started in 1988. That's a long time. That's almost 20 years. You're almost selling, but in 20 years. And when you step back and go, are we further along than we were before? Or are we doing some of the same things just with a different audience? The answer is you are further along. Because when we talk about what we're trying to sustain, it is those statewide and community outcomes, but more importantly, it is the infrastructure. And that's one of the key things that I want to be able to talk about. It's, those infra it's the infrastructure and the systems, the relationships, the effective policy programs and strategies that produce them. And I say that because what that does mean is, is not only are there going to be some things that you, we need to look at differently and change, but it's also things at the federal government level that we have to change. When we look at the state outcome examples particularly, I just want to share with you all, Texas has a strategic prevention framework grant. Part of what this conference is going to be about is, is, is thinking of how we're going to be planning and assessing and then figuring out what we want to be able to do from that. We recognize now that when we help facilitate and we help fund the state to do, to take, to step back, to figure out what you all need to be doing, how you need to plan, and then get out of your way so you can do what you need to do, things have been very successful. One of the things that the strategic prevention framework is all about it is about being able to give states funding, have you look at your data, have you look at where your need is, and funding that need. I will never forget, as a director of the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention, when we were doing this and we were talking to the states about this, the states kept asking me, Beverly, are you, you know, in some of our states, what we really need, because we're a rural state, is we need we, through all of our data sets and what we found out from our local communities is we really need to fund after school programs because young people need something to do afterwards. If you're out, if your state is pretty rural and you don't have anything else to do, our kids are going to get in trouble. They're going to find something else to do that may not be productive. And they would say, you know, is, that's the kind of thing we need, but you know, we can't really fund it with SAMHSA funds. And I, would, and I would look at them and say, what does your data tell you? Does your data tell you you need that? And they said, well, yeah, our data tells us we need it. I said, well, then fund it. And they looked at me and go, you mean we can really fund what we need to fund? It's like, yes, you can fund what you need to fund. I had, I had others who, who actually talked to me about, quite frankly, needing to, re to fund services after people come out of treatment. We know treatment works. We know that the medical intervention will, it does work. But you all, we recognize that in order to have people achieve recovery, it's all the things that happen after treatment. And for, the, and for the majority history of our country, we have not done the very smart thing that all of you all who are treatment providers in the room know we've needed to fund, is what happens after treatment. Because that's when the real key things, the stressors will come into play. That's when people are, who are going back and are going to have to deal with all of those, the things that they have to deal with in terms of being able to, to to go back to the way it was before they became addicted. We've always known that. We, when people used to say um, we would be running, we'd be funding homeless programs for people uh, who did no longer had a house, we, would, I, we learned a great lesson from people just sitting down, talking, uh, sitting down talking to people who were homeless. And I would say to them, I said, you all, please talk to me. Tell me what's the best thing that we can do for you to be able to help you in your recovery. And they said, you know what, Beverly? You know, we, you ask us to go to all these meetings, to sit in this session, to do this and do that, and then we can get housing. The real truth of the matter is give us the housing first so we can get stabilized, and then we can begin to do all these other things. Because while you're trying to get us to change behavior and doing these other things, and we're still trying to find a place to stay, and, 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 and whether or not we're going to sleep on the bridge tonight, we can't focus on our recovery. And so I began to, you know, as one, as one of the states said to me, this is something we really need to fund. We need to fund child care for women who are in treatment. We need to fund stable housing. We need to be able to fund job training. Can we do that? I said, yeah, you can. Show me what your need is. And you all, I, I have to just be able to say this. As we began to, to look at this and, and states began to fund their need, we are seeing such an incredible, incredible difference. 
And the same thing, uh, Director Walters talked about the difference with the community level outcomes. We have found that this whole process of meeting and planning and helping to look at your data and look at those kinds of things are very, very key to success. And what we have found with the drug-free community coalitions, they have facilitated that kind of planning and action to be able to make those things work. I have given you this handout because it's really, really key for you to see that these kind of planning processes, and I know we have to still do meetings, but many of those meetings may be necessary because we have to plan. I know you all have heard about if you fail to plan, then you, if you fail to plan, then you plan to fail. And those kinds of things have to ha those kinds of things do need to happen. And when we talk about infrastructure, we, well, let's talk about what infrastructure are we talking about? And I have always said this. There are going to be things as, as we take some questions at the end. What is it that the federal government can do? And I'll put one of the first things on the table. We need to fund the infrastructure, and the infrastructure is you all. And we need to fund you long enough so that you can focus in on being able to help your communities and not about writing the next grant. I have put on the table one of the first things I did as a CSAP director is to change all of our funding streams to five-year funding. Now I'm really pushing to change all of our funding streams to 10-year funding. Wouldn't it be great if you all got a 10-year grant and you didn't have to worry about that? Because when you're dealing with this issue, it takes a long time to address those issues in comprehensive ways. And we need to do that both at the state and the community levels. And so when we talk about our state infrastructure, these are the kinds of things that we need to support. We need to be able to support your capacities to have to support your policy groups, your advisory groups, strategic plans, your funding mechanisms, your evaluations, because we will also give you money and tell you how, to have to, how you have to take part of that to do an evaluation when, when, when in all honesty, that evaluation you need to do costs way more, costs far more than 15 percent of your grant, which is what we normally allocate. And then we ask you all to use that, and then we want you to find some other monies to support that so that we can, so you can help prove that that's an effective practice. The funding you need is much more than that, and we need to step back and we need to partner. We at the federal level need to partner with NIDA and NIMH and NIAAA so that you can use the service money you get from SAMHSA or from any of us at HRSA, OMH, the Office of Minority Health, Women's Health. Use your money for services because you need it for services. And let's partner with the other agencies who do research to be able to fund that so that you essentially gain additional 15 percent to all of your grants. Training and technical assistance capacity. I want to be able to, as we begin to start looking at these things over the lifespan, these are all the kinds of things that you have. You all would be surprised at how much training in TA is out there from all the different agencies. And we're going to go through that at the very, toward the end. There are so many agencies that are funding training and technical assistance that we don't have access to. The Office of Minority Health actually has a capacity building training that will actually come in and actually fund volunteer development, uh, staff development, those kinds of things. But those are not the kinds of things that we know about. So I want to be able to make sure that you all know that these are the kinds of things that the federal government should be doing and that we will be increasing. When we talk about maintaining your community infrastructure, that infrastructure really is about your coalitions. It's about all of you as providers. And, and caregivers who are coming together to make sure that you are putting together programs that really do connect the dots. It is about your leadership, your vision, and the guts to be able to act on what you know you need to do. As, 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 as I talk about prevention across the lifespan, I just want to be able to use this as a great example. There's a story of three sisters. Uh, they are Native American. They're walking along the streams. And as they are walking along the streams, what they do is they see, they, look, they hear some noise. And they look over into the, um, into the river, and they actually see that there are children in the river who are floating down. These children are drowning. Well, the first sister jumps into the river, and she obviously starts swimming toward the children to try to save the children. So she, so she brings them, and she gets the first child. She gets them to the shore. She goes back to get more. She calls to her other sister, who is, who is watching this, and says, come help me. The second sister jumps into the river, and they start trying to grab the children as these children are going down the streams to save the children. Well, they call to the third sister, who looks at the situation, and she's a preventionist, and she takes off, and she takes off running up the stream. Well, the other two sisters are in the water going, what is she doing? She has now just left us. What is she doing? That third sister has gone up the stream to figure out why the children are in the river in the first place. She gets to the village, and she realizes that the little fence that they had built has come apart, and the children are just wandering through the fence getting into the river. And I say that because, again, you all, 
So many of us are so key, we're, we're dealing with the people drowning that we never take the time to stop to figure out why they're drowning in the first place. We've got to get past putting an ambulance at the bottom of the cliff and waiting for people to fall off and then treating them there as opposed to putting up a fence to keep them from falling. And I say that because you all so many times, we've got to think about how we are focusing in on prevention in general. It, this is about substance prevention, but it is also about all of the other things that we have to be able to do. When we start looking at zero to three, we've got to be able to figure out what are we doing with, with people that we are dealing with to be able to make sure that children are being born that they start off strong with healthy and safe lives. And these are the kinds of things that in your planning efforts, think about what, you, what we should be doing. We should be having, you know, again, dealing with pediatric doctors. They should be so much a part of, of what you're doing so that every child can be born healthy and safe. We've got to make sure that we are increasing our funding for fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. We've got to make sure that we are adding child development funding to women treatment programs. Thank you, uh, Tommy, was we talked about how in the world can we have treatment programs and not make sure that the children of those women are also being taken care of. The hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. And we've got to make sure that those children are in fact, are in fact grow up healthy and safe. Parent education programs. Now, I just have to ask this question. How many of you all, when you, uh, when you had your children, when you, when you picked up that beautiful bundle of joy, it came with a manual, a how-to manual? Most of us, again, we are all learning by what, we, by what we've seen, by what our parents did, et cetera. We've got to make sure, ladies and gentlemen, that we are increasing parent, because you all, this is a whole different age. My, my, they're into texting. They, they do. They, they, they put their business up on my face and my space, and you know they'll tell all their business. I was like, I remember someone asked me, "Well, can I put you on my, 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 my face or my space page?" And I said, "Well, what, what do I have to answer if you do that?" And I said, "Well, tell about yourself. Talk about your age, your height, your weight." And I looked at him and said, "You want me to put my weight out there? Are you out your mind?" I'm thinking to myself, and this generation of young people have no problem in doing any of that. You know, they're, they're, they're internet savvy. They text by, I mean, within seconds. They've communicated to 50 or 60 people. We're different. So we've got to be able to make sure that we are, in fact, keeping up. We've got to make sure that we are, in fact, one of the number one things to helping people grow up successful, guess what, is a two things that we have found in our most recent CDC study that hasn't been released yet, a healthy start and education. Those are the number one and two indicators for a productive and healthy life, for people not going to jail, et cetera, education and a good start. So here are the kinds of things that we need to be able to do. As, as Director Walter said, let's, talk, let's do screening and brief interventions when people go to, to the doctor so that it's a matter of course. We've got to make sure that all of our environments are being able to focus in on healthy and safe behaviors. Why we would not have exercise in the schools anymore, we've got to change that. Because it's got to be a, a part of healthy living, mentally healthy living. And we've got to be able to make sure that whatever we're doing, we're helping all of our young people to increase their skill, their coping abilities, et cetera, so that they can grow up to be healthy. It will promote their social, emotional, and healthy development. As they get older, we've got to make sure that we are focusing in on addressing alcohol and drug abuse, those things early. And again, I keep, you'll see that we're building, these are, these are building blocks. It's about being able to change, to look at overall wellness, because one of the best things we can be able to do to prevent alcohol and drug abuse is begin to help our young people think about overall wellness as, the way, as a way of life. Most importantly, for adults, we, it's real easy when people think about prevention, they think about young people. But let's not, let's not forget about the fact that we have got to make sure that we are dealing with adults as well. One of the key things that in, in, in San Antonio, I remember on Friday nights, it used to be called frequent flyer night. That's what the doctors called it. Because on frequent flyer night, they would constantly deal with people coming in and out of the emergency rooms who were involved in gunshots and overdose and all of those kinds of things. And I remember back in 1992, when we began to put uh, licensed chemical dependency counselors in the emergency rooms with our doctors. Because at that moment, when someone comes in with a gunshot wound, at that moment in time, they're actually very willing to consider a lifestyle change. And the doctor talking to them, saying, you know, it's important, you know, it's important, yeah, we're going to patch you up, but let's talk about why you're here in the first place.
And the fact that the doctor could spend that two or three or four minutes with that person talking to them about their behavior was beginning to make a tremendous amount of difference. Our, our treatment utilization rate increased by 200%. We went from having uh, t tons of, 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 of actually people on waiting lists to us being able to increase our city and county funding for treatment such that we reduced the waiting list down to less than five people. We began to connect up all of our treatment providers so that they too had like a hotel reservation system. So that they, they partnered so that when someone walked into a treatment center and they, they didn't have a bed, they could quickly key into the computer and find another treatment provider who had that bed instead of that client going from here to here to here trying to find that referral process that did not work. It required us to do some things differently. And yes, it required us to have to share some things that we normally had not shared. Making sure that we are thinking about what we have to do for our senior citizens. Getting them, continuing to get them active and involved with what we're doing. And particularly involved with our young people. I will never forget um, one of the most key things that really helped us with our seniors, as we called them our council of wisdom and our council of elders. Getting them involved with those young people, particularly those young people who had been juvenile delinquents, to watch them. One of, we were able to reduce our juvenile delinquency rate by 50%. Let me just share with you how. It was by those, uh, our senior citizens adopting, mentoring those young people. We had a problem with our senior citizens. We asked them what was the most important thing that we could do for them to change our quality of life. They actually said, buy us. Um, we want to be able to do a crime prevention program. And I said, okay, because they said, because we constantly get our stuff stolen. And I said, well, what would you want us to fund? And they said, air conditioners. And I went, air conditioners? And they said, yes, air conditioners. And I said, okay, because I'm going to go with the flow, and then I'm gonna, we're going to fund this, and I guess I'm going to look for a job. You know, <laughs> but in doing so, I, I, I said, okay, we're going to go with this. And we gave our Council of Elders money for air conditioners. Can anybody tell me why that might have been a crime prevention program? What, I'm sorry, Ellen, what'd you say? Doris Locke, anybody else? We're in Texas? Okay. Exactly right. Keeping their windows shut. In our neighborhoods, we had young people who would be crawling through. Uh, many of our seniors were in older homes. They did not have central air and heat. So they had to keep their windows open. Many of these young people would crawl through the windows, steal their stuff, crawl back out, and leave. So when our, young, so when our elders said that they wanted air conditioners for as a crime prevention, they were putting the air conditioners in these windows to prevent crime, but also they went and found all those young men because they knew who they were, and they had those young people put those air conditioners in for them. What it did is it began to have those young people see that when these, you know, that at that point in their life, when they took a picture frame or when they took things from these elders, how much it meant. And I will tell you, watching those young people change, to actually hear them say, no, Tommy, you can't mess with Miss Jones. She, she mentors me. Now, you can go steal from somebody else, but you can't steal from her. I mean, to watch them and that change. 50% reduction in youth crime. This is what we're trying to get to you all. Although this says that this is really about methamphetamine, this is really about what all we do. We are really looking at trying to recenter and putting our clients in the middle and putting providers and all of us around them to try to be able to meet their need. Helping us to split that up so that each one of us can take a piece of that. And I am saying, as we look at over the life plan, we are going to have to change the way we do business. Because again, we can no longer be, have someone come in and feel like we can meet all their needs. No one of us, not any one of us, can actually meet the needs that, are, that, that, are, that we have to deal with in terms of substance abuse. It's going to take many of us partnering to, in fact, do that. I just want to be able to um, just say to you all very, very quickly, I want you all to think of something different. As we know, we know that the Administration for Children and Family funds Head Start. But did you also know that they also fund after school programs? The Center for Disease Control funds research. But did you also know that they fund community partnerships? HRSA actually funds community clinics, but they also fund substance abuse and mental health. The Office of Minority Health funds vaccination, but they also fund community partnerships for business innovation. The Corporation for National Community Service, it funds AmeriCorps, but they also, fund, they also fund staff development. 
The Department of Labor funds job training. We understand that. But they also fund reentry programs. The Bureau of Justice Assistance funds all kinds of things with criminal justice. But they also fund neighborhood projects. They also, the housing, HUD funds housing, but they also fund community, community organizing. The Department of Education certainly funds educational programs, but they also fund universities to actually be a community partner to coalitions. The Department of Interior funds parklands, but they also fund cleanups of meth labs. The Department of Defense, we also know, funds our military, but they also fund vouchers so that our soldiers can get the kind of care we need. So I say that to you all to be able to make sure that as you're doing this, we, we, we want to focus in on, again, thinking about there is not a single pot of money out there that you all will not be able to use to address what you need. Think about yourselves as, a, as responding to this issue globally. Think, act locally, but think globally. And by all together, by all means, make sure that we understand it is all about partnerships. It is all about us working together because none of us can be successful by ourselves. Last, I know all of us in here, we work hard, we, I mean, truly, we are out saving our communities and our world. But oftentimes what we, what we forget to do is sometimes save ourselves. And I, and I just want to end with something that for those of you who have, who have ever heard me speak, you're, you're going to know what I'm going to do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask all of you all, if you're just real quickly, stand up and grab a partner very quickly. Okay. So this will be, you know, because I, you know, I, I, you all, this is a dangerous time to get between you and your, and your lunch. <laughs> so I'm going to make this good. Now what I loved, I want you all to see what here, look what they did. They just immediately, they just immediately um, held hands. And I love that. But what I want you all to do, if you will, I want, one, I want everyone to face that wall. Just everyone to face that wall. Now, I want, I want you to walk forward and put your hands on the shoulder of somebody. Put your hands on the shoulder of the person in front of you. Just, just find someone to put your hands on the shoulder of. Okay? Come on. Connect up. No, no. You, Darryl, you can connect with him. All right. Now, what I very love this. She did exactly what I wanted her to do. Very good. Connect up. Now, what I want you all to do is that this really is a time of celebration. You all have been around for a long time and you have been successful in what, you are do, what you've done. Please, pat each other on the back for the great job you do. Okay, now, give each other a quick massage. Now guys, just get over it, come on. Hold on, hold on, you're not done. See, you all thought you can get out of this. Now turn around, see, now you're gonna wish you did a better job. Pat each other on the back and give each other that massage. Come on guys, it's all right. I'm not taking pictures, okay. Now, what I want you all to just, okay. Now just stay where you are. This was, so, this was so key to what we have to deal with in our states and communities. When I asked you all to, first of all, to stand up, I want to, take, I want to thank you for taking leap of faith. Most, much of what you do is by your instinct and you knowing that you've got to be able to do it for your communities. And you follow your gut and thank God that you do. Because nine times out of 10, or 10 times out of 10, you're usually right. But I asked you all to, um, to you took a leap of faith, so thank you for that. But then I asked you all to turn that, you know, to face that wall. Now, I will tell you, there were some of you who were facing me. There were some of you who were facing that direction. There were some of you facing here, some of you facing there. But finally, what I love, this lady in the blue, what's your name? Catherine. What she automatically did is when I said, you know, reach out and, in, and I want you to touch the person from you, she brought her a whole line of folks over to connect up with them. And you all, I want you to think about something. Inside of less than two seconds, think about this, really less than three, everybody in this room connected up so that everybody in this room could enjoy something good. One of the key things in our communities, oftentimes people will come to the table to work with us, but everyone's not on the same page. Some are facing that way, some are facing that way. And it takes sometimes leadership to step out and step forward to connect those dots. She did that, and when she did that, these people followed, and those people back there watched them and followed them, and we just saw a quick movement, okay? So thanks, Catherine. Vision, vision. Secondly, when we reached out and connected, 
You all, we cannot do this issue by ourselves. It is so important for us to remember that it is all about relationships and connections. That is how we will sustain this infrastructure, which is you all, and that is how it will sustain us. We cannot do this by ourselves, particularly in these economic times. It's going to take us doing things differently so we will be successful. Thirdly, I asked you all to turn around and do for someone else what was done for you. That power of reciprocation. We have got to make sure that we are taking care of each other because we're going to get a lot of wouldn't, couldn't, shouldn't, don't have, don't have money, don't have this, don't, we're gonna, all of that. But if we remember how we have to take care of each other and the people who took care of us, we will all come out of this fine. I'm going to end with something that I always end with because it's the thing that guides me. There's a story of a young man who's walking along the beach. He's putting starfish back in the water. Many of you have heard this. Some of you haven't. And as he's doing this, there's a man up there who's watching him, and he didn't get his last grant, so he's real pissed off and mad. <laughs> and he's looking at this young man going, why is that young man putting the, those starfish back in the water? It's not going to make a difference. And he proceeds to go down there and tell that young man that. He says, son, stop wasting your time. Go find something else to do, because what you're doing doesn't make a difference. The tide just washes those starfish back up on the beach, and so what you're doing doesn't make a difference. Young man looked at the starfish. He looked at the, the gentleman, and with his little hand, he picked up as many as he could. So it was like this, and he walked as far as he could into the water and let them go. He went back up onto the shore, onto the beach, and he said, sir, it made a difference to them. Every day that you guys get up and do what you do, you make a difference to someone. You may not know it then, but you end up being the starfish throwers in our communities. You help put people back into the waters of life. You are fighting against tides of apathy, no money, continuing resolutions, less budget. Um, we want you to do more with less, all of that. But you continue to get up every day and do what you do. And I just want to take the time to thank you all for what you do. You are, in fact, the greatest reason the, the, the main reason why this country is still a great country and the best democracy in the world. Thank you so very, very much for your time. Thank you, Beverly Watts Davis. That was terrific. Got us up and stretching and terrific points there as well. We appreciate that. Much of it being on prevention. And you can't have prevention if you don't have communication, right? And um, it's so important to communicate. And I think that's what's greatly lacking in uh, families today with teenagers, which she spoke of as well. I have six children myself. Uh, most of them are older, a couple of them married now, another at college, three teenagers at home. We have an open line of communication always about drugs and alcohol and substance abuse and how important it is to avoid all of that. What a tremendous thing it is to d understand those important points about prevention in which she spoke of. Lock the gate now and learn how to do that before standing at the bottom of the river with an ambulance, as you say. Thank you very much. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is your opportunity now to really get involved in uh, the next hour. We are going to be getting out of here at 12 noon, I understand, for lunch, okay? So uh, hopefully your stomachs won't be growling too much longer. But um, this is an opportunity for you to get involved, to ask questions, to uh, talk about your communities, your areas, your neighborhoods, and what you can do to help. We have um, Dr. Let's see here, Dr. Robert Landry next. He is the founder in research and educational services. The mission of the organization is to provide training, evaluation, and consultant services to educational institutions, private entities, as well as agencies. Dr. Landry, come on up, please. And guide us through this area. Okay. Good morning. Uh, they assigned me the task of putting you to work, so I'm probably not the uh, most uh, uh, happiest face up here this morning. So, but if you're going to listen to all those great speakers and you're going to get all those great messages, you got to pay for it. So now is the time we expect our dues. Um, we're going to go through four sessions in the next two days that are work sessions associated with 
creating a plan that will be carried forward uh, by uh, Houston Crackdown and the, uh, the Office of Drug Policy. So as we go through the next uh, two days, keep in mind this is a fluid activity. It's continuous. So we have a scheduled regular work sessions in each uh, portion of the day. So we have one this morning, one this afternoon, one tomorrow morning, and one tomorrow afternoon. Hopefully by the end of those four sessions, we'll have a plan that we can pull together that represents the input of all the people who are represented here in the room. So as we go through this process, we ask that you all participate. And there are a number of different entities, occupations, and individuals represented in the room so that we respect the opinion and perceptions of all the people represented here. So as we go through it, uh, be open-minded, be flexible, and uh, participate. The, uh, the first thing we need to do is identify our, our facilitators. The facilitators are the folks that have the blue name tags like mine. So if those people would raise your hand, okay? Hopefully we have one at every table. If you are at a table that does not have a facilitator, then we need you to move to a table that has one so that we can facilitate that process or the process of planning at all of the tables. Okay, so does everyone have a facilitator at the table now? We have some extras in the back. If you don't have one, then let us know and uh, we'll get one to your table. Okay, number two, we take a look at who's representing the room. So as we go through this process, we have some idea of who you represent either by occupation or by interest. So how many of the, of the individuals here really feel like they represent prevention? Their key focus is prevention. Raise your hand. Okay. How many feel like their key focus is treatment? All right. How about criminal justice? Okay. And data collection. Do we have anybody? A few. Okay. Basically what we're looking for is that diversity that we see reflected, where we have individuals with different preferences at the same table. So that that perception, that difference in, in perce uh, perception of the issues and the problems is represented in all of the groups. So as we focus on this, you know, we want you to address your issues, address your interests and concerns. Um, there is, um, as we go through the process, you'll see on your table some resources. Uh, there are two. One, the program that you have in the back has several pieces associated with the domains that are focused here. And in the center of your table, you'll see a book uh, about uh, drug prevention, the red and blue book. And both of those are resources that you can utilize over the next two days we encourage you to take a look at them, to, uh, to review those materials as, as needed. Now, anytime we start a, uh, a process of planning, the first thing we have to do is identify the needs that exist in the community. And those needs are what we see in terms of issues and, and challenges that confront the, the people who reside in that community. So one of the first things that we're going to do is take a look at an informal needs assessment. Okay, what is the perception of the community in terms of needs, the needs that exist here, the needs that, and challenges that should be addressed in the future? So we have a short activity that is two purposes. One is to help you to uh, meet your neighbors, to share with the people that you'll be working with the next two days, and two, to identify some of those challenges and issues that we'll see uh, in the planning session. So what we would like for you to do, and for the facilitators, uh, because we don't have full tables everywhere, we're gonna do this process the same way we did at the facilitator training, which we will mix all of the groups, okay? So we'd ask everybody to stand up, and we wanna form groups of three triads. 
And we want you to get with two people that are strangers to you. Uh, the stranger, the better. <laughs> okay? So let's get a group of, let's get groups of three. Okay. All right. Now, here's what we're going to do. In our groups of three, the first thing we're going to do is we want you to, and wait till we're finished with the instructions before you start the activity. Okay, in the groups of three, the first thing we want you to do is introduce yourself quickly. Then we want you to answer three questions. Okay, the first question is, and if you need to write these down, you can. The facilitator has a copy of them, so they can share that with you. The first question is, I like where I live because. Okay, I like where I live because. Okay, question number two. My favorite leisure activity where I live is. Okay, and then question number three. If I could change one thing where I live, it would be. Okay, so those are the three questions. I'll repeat them one more time. I like where I live because my favorite leisure activity where I live is. If I could change one thing where I live, it would be. Okay, now we're going to give you five minutes to uh, discuss this. We want all three people in the group to share. So you have five minutes starting now to complete that task. Okay, real quick, we have three new questions for you. Okay, we have three new questions for you. As you see, when we go through this process, the questions will get a little more serious every time. Okay, so the first question for this group, the first question for this group is, the favorite thing the young people in my community like to do is, the favorite thing young people in my community like to do is, question number two, one thing the young people in my community do that worries the adults is, one thing that the young people in my community do that worries the adults is, and the third question, one thing that the adults in my community do that worries the youth is, okay, we have the three questions. Uh, we're going to give you 10 minutes to uh, respond to these three. First, introduce yourself like before and 10 minutes to talk about these three items. Okay, we have, we have three more questions for you to address. <laughs> okay. All right, here we go. The next set of questions. We're going to do these a little bit different because of uh, the issues that we're addressing. Okay, so we'll take five minutes for each one of these questions. So when we start, we will uh, put the timer on five minutes and we'll give you five minutes per question. Okay, the first question we want to talk about and we want to discuss in this group is, the biggest problem or challenge in my community is, the biggest problem or challenge in my community is, okay, you have five minutes. Okay, if you would, have a seat real quick. We were going to uh, give you some instructions on where lunch is and how to get there. Um, in terms of where we are in the process, if you will uh, remember what we've talked about this morning, our next session this afternoon, we'll pick up right where we're at and we'll carry forward with the planning process. So for now, we're fixing to move to lunch. We need to give you the instructions on how to get there.